This is Brain Ponderings with Mark Matson. Conversations with scientists at the forefront of brain research. So, our, my guest today is Sarkis Masmanian. He's a professor of microbiology in the Division of Biology and Biomedical uh, Engineering at Caltech. He's also an investigator in the Heritage Medical Research Institute there. Um, and we're going to talk a lot about the brain and his work and others that he can integrate into it too on how bacteria in the gut may affect the brain, which is really fascinating new really concept within the last, say, decade, I'd say. But I think, Sarkis, let's start from your PhD work briefly at UCLA when you were looking at uh, surface-associated proteins in staff. Thank you, Mark. Uh, really great to be here. Um, yeah, so going back in time, almost 25 years now, I started as a graduate student at UCLA in the laboratory of Olaf Schneewind uh, in uh, the Department of Microbiology and Immunology, where I became quite interested in how bacteria display specific proteins on their surface, uh, in particular gram-positive bacterial pathogens. Uh, and they use these proteins to adhere to tissue or to evade the immune system. Uh, and it was really fascinating that you know, it was a very fascinating process by which bacteria take these proteins that again are obviously synthesized in the cytoplasm and then secreted across the single membrane of gram positive bacteria and then covalently attached to the peptidoglycan cell wall uh, by an enzyme that Olaf had hypothesized to exist called sortase. And so uh, when Olaf himself was uh, uh, a postdoctoral fellow, um, I started working for him when he was an assistant professor a couple of years uh, after he just found his lab. Uh, he had done a set of experiments that predicted uh, the existence of uh, a protein that had really, of an enzyme actually, uh, that had really unique characteristics that it would cleave peptide bonds and form new peptide bonds um, uh, by which, again, these proteins were, were covalently anchored to the, to the cell wall. Um, and uh, when I joined the laboratory, uh, he and I decided, you know, devised a, a, a genetic screen to essentially look for this enzyme. This is, you know, before you could just easily sequence bacteria um, or set up really high throughput assays. Um, nowadays, I think you just brute force these types of things. But back then you had to roll up your sleeves and actually do the work um, in ways that, again, you know, are, are, you know move, would move much faster now. And so in a, again, just really briefly, a series of studies, we identified that enzyme, again, called sortase, uh, characterizes by chemical activity. And uh, all this work was done in Staphylococcus aureus, a very prominent uh, human pathogen, and then ultimately showed that, that the process of anchoring these proteins is, was involved in uh, the infectious uh, you know, uh, aspects of, of Staph aureus and other gram positives. Uh, and showed by deleting staph or, uh, uh, sortase and staph aureus that the organisms were less virulent, less pathogenic, uh, because again, they were just not able to adhere to tissue, which is what bacteria should do, or many bacteria should do to cause an infection. Uh, and they weren't able to evade the immune system, so they were more easily killed by neutrophils um, in the absence of you know, the about 20 or so proteins that are anchored by sortase. So really, again, interesting work, but more importantly for me, um, a great training environment. I learned so much uh, in terms of not just microbiology, but um, uh, molecular biology, genetics, uh, animal research. And I think it set me up pretty well for the next stages of my career. So the sortase then is a potential molecular target for antibiotics? It's for anti-infectives, yeah. And so uh, at the time, uh, Wyeth Ahurst, which is was a pharmaceutical company, I think subsequently purchased by Pfizer, um, licensed the, the patents from UCLA to develop small molecule inhibitors for sortase. And really, you know, the advantages are that many of these gram positives uh, have broad antibiotic resistance, yeah. um, partly because when you put bacteria under a selective pressure, 
uh, of antibiotics which kill the bacteria, then bacteria uh, you know, will mutate or mutants will arise that are resistant to antibiotics because of that, of that selective pressure. Again, we deal with this in society now all the time. We hear uh, about, about broadly uh, 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 antibiotic resistant bacteria, including Staph aureus and Enterococcus and, and others that have sore cases. And so what was attractive to pharmaceutical companies uh, was again, a, new, a novel target, but that the drug would be A, uh, an anti-infective because sortase is not required for the viability of bacteria. You can delete sortase in, in, in I think every organism where it was studied, like you know, many dozens of organisms where it's been studied over the years and the bacteria live just fine, but they just, it can't cause infection or they're reducing their ability to cause infection. So that's attractive as a target. And what's also attractive is that the enzyme is extracellular, right? So you don't have to get the drug across the membrane into the cytoplasm bacteria, which just creates more barriers and, and uh, challenges for, for drugs. Um, but uh, for some, for a set of corporate reasons that I was not uh, uh, privileged to, to, to know, uh, why I stopped their research and then returned the patents back to you. So I said, to the best of my knowledge, th that, that technology is still at UCLA and not being developed by pharma. And I suspect all those patents have, have run out of uh, their patent life. All right, so now let's, why don't you talk about good bacteria in the gut and kind of an evolutionary perspective. And then you can start talking about interactions between the gut bacteria and the immune system locally in that, you know, you know just outside or within the gut. Yeah, and so in terms of, of so the arc of my, my career, uh, as I was thinking, about next steps after graduate school, uh, I was really open to, to any possibility that included uh, research on microbes. I, I felt, uh, you know, I won't talk about how I got to, to um, researching microbiology in the first place, but once I did, I, I fell in love with, with what are really just like ingenious little creatures, super efficient at everything that they do. And I wanted to really build my career in microbiology, but was open to, to you know, really new areas. And as I mentioned, my training was in bacterial pathogenesis or infectious disease, which you know, along with metabolism bacteria were like two pretty well developed areas of microbiology. And I wanted to do something a little bit different than that. Um, and and you know, started reading you know, widely, talking to people, um, but it was very much uh, one article that I read uh, it was a two-page article written by Jeff Gordon at WashU, a very prominent scientist in the microbiome field, um, who's, who had done at the time and continues to do just absolutely groundbreaking breaking work um, looking at the microbiome. And essentially the take home of that article, um, again, this is like, this is 2001, right? The take home message for that article was um, that there are all these bacteria that live in our intestines, not just us, but all animals to the best of our knowledge. And we really don't understand what they're doing or why our immune system tolerates them. Um, and I was, I was hooked, right? Because it, it, it was, it checked all the boxes because it was sort of this, you know, you know, new area of research, completely understudied, but you can clearly see its importance to human health, right? And orthogonal to, to infections. And so I went to Dennis Casper's lab at, uh, at Harvard Medical School um, to essentially set up a, a research program where I can look at the, the function of bacteria, the function of bacteria in terms of their interactions with the immune system. And um, in that work, Dennis and I discovered that there are, there's a bacteria and a bacterial molecule um, that induces an anti-inflammatory response in mice. And again, this is counterintuitive. Right? So yeah. if you think about, you know, how we react to bacteria, we, we mount a pro-inflammatory response or we activate our immune system when we get an infection so that we can control the, the pathogen or the bacteria or viruses and, and other pathogens would be the same. But here was a bacteria that lived in humans called Bacteries fragilis. Um, about half of the healthy human population has this organism to, to varying degrees uh, of colonization. And not only is it tolerated by the immune system, it isn't rejected by the immune system 
you know, in the gut, like let's say salmonella or pathogenic E. coli would, but it actually uh, uh, almost educated the immune system and uh, shaped an anti-inflammatory response I mentioned. Um, and in later years, after I started my own lab here at Caltech, we realized, you know, why this organism was doing that. So I'll just fast forward just real quick for context is that the organism didn't want to be attacked by the immune system. So essentially uh, it suppressed inflammation in its local environment where it lives, in particular nooks and crannies of the colon. And um, that's how it essentially sets up symbiosis with its host um, and can then essentially colonize for the life of that, of that animal. And we believe the same thing happens in humans. Um, again, what was in my mind really groundbreaking here yeah, exactly. wasn't just a discovery of, of the, the effect, but that this effect was specific to a particular bacterial molecule. And then that leads, that you know, lends itself to a number of experiments that could be done uh, to really get at uh, mechanisms of action. And so, yeah, that, that's what I did uh, in the next step, next stage of my career. But again, um, just seeing that, that immune response and this, you know, very different immune response to this particular organism than what we traditionally think of how immunity uh, plays a role in bacterial colonization or infection, uh, led me to believe that there's probably new biology uh, to be discovered uh, and you know, I think the, the field has shown that to be true. So Bacterius fragilis is one species of bacteria in the gut. How, how many different, you know, in the average person, I guess, yeah. yes, how many different types of bacteria? Depends on how you count and by how means like what sequence uh, uh, divergence uh, is a cutoff for one species versus another, but the, uh -huh. the estimates are two to 500 different bacterial species that live in humans are all different from each other in, in discernible ways. You can, in, by DNA sequencing, you can identify differences both between people and within people over time. But our microbiome, a person's microbiome is much more similar to theirs over time than it is to, to anyone else's. Um, and, um, and much more similar to other humans than to you know, the, our closest animals, even animals that live in our, in our homes. So, so I think that what that shows, there, there are constraints, right? There are certain you know, forces, I think largely immune system, but diet and metabolism and you know, gut architecture as well that allow certain organisms to foster in humans you know, better than, than other mammals and a selection that, that defines uh, inter-individual variability within humans or between humans. And, and so you discover that that one species suppresses inflammation locally. Is it affecting, could you just briefly describe the two arms of the immune system, innate and adaptive, and is, are the bacteria affecting both or just one? Yeah, so, so as I say, Mark, there are, you know, these two general arms of the immune system, you know, there, there's many, many, you know, facets to the immune system, but the innate immune system is are our cells that are ready to respond uh, in a very short amount of time. They recognize patterns on bacteria. They may not know exactly what the bacteria are, but they can know that it is a bacteria, not a, a human cell. And that's how they become activated um, through innate uh, uh, immune receptors, such as the ones you've worked on, uh, these toll like receptors. Um, but again, these are cells that rapidly respond um, to hopefully control the infection. And then over time, we develop what is called a, an adaptive immune system, which is much more specific to the sequences of proteins uh, on a target cell, in this case, let's say a bacteria. Um, but that takes you know, roughly about seven days or, or so, give and take. Uh, and these are uh, generally known as T cell or B cell responses. And they're much more specific and much more potent but of course they take a little bit longer. So the innate and immune, uh, adaptive immune systems work together where the innate immune system, again, begins to control the infection, but also starts uh, the process of activating the adaptive immune system in that first week after the infection. Oftentimes our innate immune system just control infections. You know, many times we don't even know, you know that we've come in contact with a microbe or a virus because our innate immune system just does such a great job that we don't feel anything. But in those cases where innate immunity cannot control the infection, then the adaptive immune system kicks in. Um, and in terms of, of bacteria's fragilis, um, it activates both, right? Because um, obviously, you know, it's those innate immune cells that are required uh, 
to prime oh, yeah. and, and activate and induce proliferation of the adaptive immune cells. And so what we've learned over the years are that there are specific populations of innate immune cells called dendritic cells. Uh, and even within dendritic cells there are specific subsets of dendritic cells that display receptors uh, these pattern recognition receptors, these toll like receptors that recognize the molecule from bacteria's fragilis. That molecule is called PSA. So, specific receptors, uh, they include both TLR2 mainly, but others uh, recognize PSA. And then um, that induces a, a program, a, a cellular differentiation program within dendritic cells that then um, those dendritic cells interact, physically interact with T cells because um, what dendritic cells do is they, they display microbial components on their surface through major histocompatibility complex molecules, in this case, MHC molecule, MHC class two molecule in, in particular, that um, essentially presents a sequence to the T cell and then selects for those T cells that have a receptor called the T cell receptor that would recognize specifically that microbial sequence. So that's how you get the, that exquisite uh, response from the adaptive immune system. So this entire process, again, is orchestrated by PSA, but again, very differently from an infection, the outcome of this process results not in T cells that attack or become activated to induce inflammation, but rather T cells that are very potently immunosuppressive, right? Um, these are uh, called regulatory T cells. So um, just in terms of, of the adaptive arm and focusing specifically on T cells, we in our bodies have T cells that are, you know, let's say likened it to a loaded gun, right? They're ready to attack when there's an infection. There are other cells that are the safety on the immune system uh, or the breaks in the immune system called these regulatory T cells. And it's these regulatory T cells that keep, again, these pro-inflammatory T cells in check until they need to respond. Right, And again, what the bacteria does is essentially co-ops that system to induce regulatory T cells that then uh, suppress the local immune environment around the bacteria so that the immune system doesn't attack the bacteria. And again, that's how symbiosis is established um, and maintained over many, many years. And that's the same scenario, general scenario would apply to viral infections. That's right, that, that's right. right. It's been shown that there are some viruses that induce regulatory T cells as well, or that require an anti-inflammatory and immune suppressive environment for their, for their you know, colonization. Now, there's a question that just popped in my mind. Is someone doing studies of, I imagine they are, that gut microbiota composition and susceptibility to COVID? Uh, there, there's a number of studies now that have come out in the last few years, not our work, uh, we don't work on COVID, but a number of studies that have shown that particular microbiomes uh, correlate with people who are more or less uh, susceptible to infection or have more or less severe infection. Um, what's, you know, and, and this has been broadly replicated, so, so I do believe that there are particular microbiome fingerprints that uh, associate with, you know, either the infection or the, or the severity. Um, but what's important to remember is that all of these studies were done at a time when samples were taken, either you know, a person was or was not infected oh, yeah. with, with COVID. And so we don't know if yeah. that fingerprint existed before the infection and mediated that outcome or some other forces you know, resulted, like a, a person that just has a stronger immune system or their diet or their lifestyle allowed them to, to be more resistant. You know, and then the infection shaped their immune system differently. Ah, but, and so, but one could look at um, the antibody response to vaccine, and you're right. So, so and, and no other person had a prior infection, right? Yeah. So what you've said so far, I would think maybe fragilis might enhance the the, the uh, immune response to the vaccine. No. It's never been looked at, to my knowledge, um, but uh, it's certainly, po I mean, I, I think the pieces are there to suggest that, that it's certainly possible, right, um, that it may act in, 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 as an adjuvant, but it may either have no effect, right, or, um, or there are other bacteria, if the microbiome is involved in, in response to COVID, there are other bacteria that are at play, and people are, are now looking at, at that, right, so they're doing more mechanistic or functional studies, but um, uh, what I, I can tell you 
you know, based on, on work that we have done uh, either internally or through collaboration is that this anti-inflammatory response that PSA induces doesn't suppress immunity in the individual. That's, I wanna be super clear about this, right? So it actually helps us fight off other infections, yeah. which initially you think to yourself, all right, if you're down-regulating the immune system, maybe the person's more prone to an infection, but it's actually the opposite. What PSA does, or bacteria fragilis does through PSA, it essentially balances the immune system in a way that may suppress it during, you know, homeostasis, during stasis when there's no infection, but also allows it to unleash the proper immune response during an infection. And so we've shown in bacterial infections like Listeria monocytogenes infections in mice that PSA promotes a better clearance of the organism. And then Ed Canton, a, a collaborator of ours um, at City of Hope, showed that PSA treatment induces a response that, that makes animals better able to fight off herpes infections. And um, others have shown that PSA it helps out fight off other viral infections as well. So it really like augments the immune system in ways that, that I think protect the host. And if I may speculate, and this is pure speculation because it's an evolutionary argument, that you know, if we're colonized long-term with a bacteria, it's in the bacteria's best interest to make yeah. sure that we're healthy, right? Yeah. We're the only place where bacteria spagyllis lives. It doesn't live in other mammals or it doesn't live in aquatic or terrestrial ecosystems. So the healthier we are, the longer we live, the longer bacteria spagyllis has a hospitable home. I'm only speculating that yeah. that's it, it's, it's invested in improving our immune response. That makes sense. All right. so move to the brain now the brain seems way away from the gut how could how could the bacteria in the gut possibly affect the brain <laughs> yeah we get we you mentioned this so, so we got interested in animal models of multiple sclerosis over the years so initially you know our laboratory worked on on inflammation in the gut because for the exact same reason that you just mentioned that's where the bacteria are which it initially made more sense to place the bet on looking at immune responses in the intestine. But over the years with those successes uh, in identifying that indeed there was a, this interplay between, between gut bacteria and the immune system, we got a little bit more adventurous, adventuresome if you will, and started looking at other tissues, particularly the brain, and asked, do those, do those effects, those immune modular effects I just um, described, do they extend to, to other tissues, even distal ones and protected ones, right, such as the brain? Um, and we showed that animals that are, uh, you know, undergo a, a multiple sclerosis-like um, uh, central uh, uh, um, uh, nervous system inflammation, brain and spinal cord inflammation, in a model called uh, experimental autoimmune encephalomyelitis, or EAE, which is an animal model for multiple sclerosis, that those animals could be protected from this autoimmune disease through bacteria spagyllis and through PSA, if we just gave you know, high enough concentration systemically, we can now induce this anti-inflammatory effect in the brain, which again, it counteracts the disease because the disease is a, a disease of inflammation, right? So it's a, a, side, a side note, but I think it's really, really important is you know, when our immune system becomes overactivated, that leads to autoimmune diseases or allergic diseases. And so controlling the immune system is, is important for long-term health. And, and so what we just again showed in those models is that there is, you know, the effect of these gut bacteria do, do transmit to the brain. And so it was around that time that I started, um, uh, you know, essentially a friendship <laughs> with, with Paul Patterson. Paul was a oh, neuroscientist yeah. here at Caltech. Um, well, I, I've known him from way back when I or known of him, actually. I don't even know if I've met him from back when I was a postdoc studying cultured neurons and the, the growth of growth cones and formation of synapses. And he was developing these chips to grow neurons on. Yeah. And yeah, but anyway. Was Caltech or when he was previously at Harvard? Uh, I think he'd moved, to, he's been at Caltech a long time, right? He was, yeah, yeah. He started his career at Harvard and then moved to Caltech um, early yeah. in his career. And he was here for well over, it's 30, 30 or 35 years. Yeah, he, he was at Caltech. Yeah, he passed away very sadly. He passed away in 2014. Um, oh, I didn't know that. We had, you know, begun our friendship just as colleagues um, prior to that. Um, he was a great mentor to me uh, when I was starting my career here. Um, 
And we were having, I tell the story often. So we were having, you know, coffee one day and um, I, I was telling him about our work on intestinal inflammation and bacterial spagyllus. Um, and, he, you know, Paul, you know, sounds like he knew him. Uh, Paul was a man of few words, right? But when he spoke, it was like just jewels, pearls of knowledge would come out, right? Uh, and he mentioned that he had read a curious article that had linked gastrointestinal symptoms to children with autism. And at the time, these were like, you know, I'd say very anecdotal uh, case studies. Um, and you'd hear things from, you know, and he had heard things from like parents and caregivers, but obviously we want to make sure that we're really, you know, grounding ourselves in, in, in work that had been, you know, rigorously uh, vetted. Um, and those, I have to admit, um, those connections weren't strong at the time. Again, this is about 15 years ago now. Um, but uh, he had also concurrently to this conversation uh, begun to develop an animal model that um, uh, looked at environmental contributors to autism and schizophrenia. And so this is what I'm about to describe is entirely Paul's work. Um, and so uh, there were epidemiologic data at the time, but again, about 15 years ago, which have been reinforced now, uh, that show uh, a link between infection during pregnancy, not vaccines, but it's infection during pregnancy, um, and uh, uh, ultimately a, a, a diagnosis of autism after birth. Um, that it, women who had a very severe infection, it's not a common cold, right, but a severe infection often was coupled with a high fever hospitalization, were at increased risk of having a child with autism. And so, again, large population studies in Sweden and Denmark, there was a study more recently, uh, there are two studies here in California, they looked at two, two million families and, and came to the, those same conclusions. And so uh, Paul was very interested in the role of environment in shaping animal behavior um, and modeled this epidemiologic finding by giving pregnant mice the flu. Uh, he later used a viral mimic called PolyIC, which essentially tricks the immune system into thinking it was infected by a virus, which is a cleaner experimental model, but you know, uh, immunologically should be similar to a viral infection um, and showed that whether it was the flu or, or influenza or you know, this, this viral mimic PolyIC uh, given to pregnant female mice, pregnant dams, that the offspring, many of the offspring had features, behavioral features that were consistent with uh, autism and schizophrenia and certain neuropathologies, changes in brain structure and, and the migration of certain cell types uh, in the brain that had been shown in, su in some subsets of individuals with autism in postmortem brain samples. Um, and so he was very obviously very interested being a neuroscientist and what is the neurobiology behind this and the effects on behavior. And I remember in that same conversation where he mentioned the, the GI issues in, in children with autism, I said, Paul, I'm sure you're throwing the intestines of your mice away. Uh, and he said, of course I am. Yeah, as a neuroscientist. I said, next time you do an experiment, um, let me know and we'll, I'll send a student over to your lab and we'll just collect the intestines. Um, you don't have to even do a separate experiment for us and let us just look around and see what we find. Uh, and so this was the work of Elaine Shao, uh, who is a graduate student in Paul's lab, who is now a professor at UCLA uh, and a student in my lab, uh, Janet Chow. Uh, so Janet went to Paul's lab the next time Elaine had a cohort of animals, she dissected the intestines. And I remember even on the first experiment, we found elevation of inflammatory markers in the mice whose mothers had gotten flu compared to animals that just got saline, which is a, a negative control, right? And I was hooked immediately. And so over the years, I'll uh, just fast forward here, over the years uh, in collaboration with Paul, we showed that it wasn't just inflammation, but there was a, a gut pathology um, and the intestines were different in terms of their function. The microbiome was different in animals that had behavioral symptoms consistent with autism um, and uh, that, you know, particular bacteria, including bacteria spagyllus, could improve both the GI symptoms in the mice, as well as many, not all, but many of the behavioral changes in animals that included changes in anxiety, uh, improvements essentially in anxiety, improvements in vocalization, improvements in repetitive behavior, improvements in sensory responses in mice. And, and as you, know, you may know, and your audience will know, many of those features 
anxiety, vocalization, socialization, sensory issues are prominent, in fact, defining features of human autism. Um, and so, again, really exciting for a microbiologist, you know, through this, this wonderful collaboration to be able to, you know, identify connections to, uh, you know, a, a very enigmatic behavioral disorder, um, one that uh, still is hard to, to you know, uh, uh, treat. I use treat the word treat with some reservation because many individuals with autism uh, are very high functioning. There's, I don't think there's anything to treat. And many people who do have a diagnosis, I think it's just a, a different way of life or different personality. But there are severely affected individuals who do need um, either intensive behavioral care or even therapeutics. Um, and so it's, this is an endeavor that we're you know, quite committed to these days. That has some implications too for the pregnant mom, right? And in addition to the you know, severe infection, there's some evidence, my understanding, that women with obesity and type 2 diabetes during pregnancy, there's an increased risk of having a child that falls on the spectrum. And so there is, you know, one could imagine, um, and, and, it, and also there's, I think, quite a bit of evidence that the problems begin when the baby's developing in the womb. There, there, there's a lot of evidence in mice and, and obviously, you know, associations in humans, because you just can't do the experiments uh, in humans that you can do in mice. But um, you mentioned uh, metabolic uh, uh, abnormalities or changes, uh, obesity, high fat diet, it's, you know, that's been modeled in, in animals and it's shown to result in the, in the mothers and it's been shown to yeah. result in behavioral changes and microbiome changes in, in mice. Um, uh, what's really, and I think the common thread may, this is not definitive, but the common thread here may be the microbiome as well, right? Because the, the microbiome is intimately tied to our metabolism, um, depending on, you know, certain estimates, um, at least the maybe up to a third or between a third and a half of all the small molecules in our body are either produced by bacteria in our, in our gut or are somehow transformed, chemically changed by bacteria in our gut. And so, you know, we are a product of, of human and microbial co-metabolism, right? And, and that affects uh, all of our metabolism, but also diet, right? So diet you know, very strongly shapes the way our microbiomes look a lot. And I won't talk about this, a lot of research in humans as well, right? With dietary interventions, which show that the configuration of our microbial communities depends on our diet. And so as diet changes or metabolism changes, it reshapes the microbiome and it gives the microbiome different functions, right? And so there are, you know, a number of people, um, Mauro uh, Cosimaltioli at, at Baylor, June Hugh, at Harvard and many others that are looking into, into these relationships and showing that changes in the microbe, microbiome will either affect you know, particular organisms that impact the oxytocin system or other, other systems that are involved in, in autism or shape the immune system in ways that, that are believed, again, in the mouse models, with some correlates to humans are believed to shape behavior, right? Um, and so I think that there's, again, a number of different um, uh, events that can happen in pregnancy that, you know, impact prenatal brain development that can, uh, you know, that correlate at least in mice with, with um, you know, behaviors that associate with autism and other neurodevelopmental disorders, it's not, it's not just autism, um, which if any of this translates to humans, and again, people working very hard to, to test these, uh, these concepts in, in people now, it gives us windows into identifying who's, what pregnancies are high risk and what we may be able to do about that. Right, whether they're you know, I'll just speculate again, uh, whether probiotics or dietary changes or even uh, immunomodulators um, or metabolic um, uh, corrections, that maybe we can mitigate uh, potential uh, 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 you know diagnosis of autism by looking at, at individuals who are high risk during pregnancy. Again, yeah. pure speculation, but I think the the connections are there in the animal models. When I was a lab chief at NIH, I had a, a postdoc fellow who then went up to Harvard and um, he, he, he turned out, he ended up being a fecal donor because he had really good bacterial flora. And my understanding is fecal transplants that is taking the feces from 
someone who's really healthy has a good gut bacterial composition. It's been it's used clinically in some inflammatory bowel disorders. Is that the the major successes for fecal transplants, uh, otherwise known as fecal microbiota transplants or FMTs, uh, have been in in Clostridium difficile or C. diff infections. And so C. diff is uh, a bacteria uh, that causes uh, a, a gastrointestinal infection or pseudomembranous colitis, okay. really severe and could be even life threatening because oftentimes it's antibiotic resistant. Um, there are uh, approaching now 10,000 uh, individuals who've received fecal transplant across many studies in many countries uh, for their C. diff infections. And it works better than any drug <laughs> that we have for, for, the, for this, for this the disorder. Um, and then the other aspect of, of all these transplants are that it's remarkably safe, right? So you can wholesale change a person's microbiome yeah. and uh, in exceedingly small cases where the, the actual, you know, material got infected or sorry, contaminated, does it actually lead to, to um, you know, any outcomes? This is, this is like super, super safe therapeutic, right? And so what you're referring to now are that people are, are testing whether fecal transplants are going to be effective in other indications beyond clostridium difficile infections. Uh, IBD is low hanging fruit, right? IBD is, is intestinal inflammation. It's known as, you may know this as Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. Um, which uh, are the two disorders under the umbrella of IBD or inflammatory bowel disease, which is essentially a form of autoimmunity where uh, the immune system becomes activated when it shouldn't. It thinks there's an infection when there likely isn't. And then long-term, that inflammation causes tissue damage and, and lots of, of you know, symptoms um, in individual in affected patients. Um, there are a number of studies already published and many more underway. Uh, the data so far appear, you know, I say promising, but not yet convincing um, that, uh, that fecal transplants are going to be effective in IBD. Again, but there's a lot of interest. So I think we're going to get to answers quite, quite soon. And it refers back to, to people like your friend, right, that you just mentioned, because what these data are telling us is that the, the material from the donor has a huge uh, effect on whether or not the fecal transplant will will be will work right. Is that it's not the uh, the recipient their, their genetic makeup their lifestyle their you know disease status that dictates whether or not fecal transplant would work, but really who that material came from right. There are super donors out there right, um, and so I think this is you know we've learned a lot over the last few years and we're I think closer to being able to identify who are the the donors that have the most therapeutic, if you will, uh, microbiomes, and what are the indications in which uh, uh, fecal transplants will be effective. Um, and people are getting getting bold, right? I mean, there are fecal transplants being done in, in autism, in Parkinson's disease, in Alzheimer's, uh, in depression. Um, early days, I, I think they're still, you know, though, though they may be interesting results, I think there's, there's no... Uh, uh, outcomes that, that we can that we can confidently claim, um, but at least the hypothesis is being tested. And so again, I think in those areas, um, whether uh, neuropsychiatric or neurodegenerative diseases, um, I, I believe we'll start getting a, a, you know some indication for fecal transplants in the near future. Obviously, the the huge impact here is the, the therapeutics and the ability to help help people. But these te these these tests are, and these clinical trials are also testing a concept. Right, a testing concept that indeed the bacteria in our gut impact complex emotional behaviors or impact the function and viability of neurons in our brains, which to me would be you know very important in, in advancing the field uh, as we currently know it. Right. So again, most of the work has been done in animal models, and I'm I'm going to talk about things that I'm, I'm most interested in these days. We need to start taking those concepts from the preclinical models and testing them in humans because of what I just referred to earlier um, in terms of the safety profile, right? There's, no, there's very low risk in actually doing the experiments in people. Uh, that's a good point to talk about Parkinson's disease. I'm gonna have Ted Dawson, who's a colleague at Hopkins, uh, do a podcast that'll cover more broadly Parkinson's, but 
I'd like you to talk about your, your interesting findings in animal models of Parkinson's and uh, which suggests an important role for the gut bacteria in, in potentially in modifying or promoting the disease process. That's right. And so um, after we had, had been working on autism for many years, we, we figured we would expand the research program into, into other indications as well. Um, and so just briefly, our lab is a basic science lab. Caltech doesn't have a, a medical center. Um, and it's really, you know, the emphasis here uh, in terms of research is trying to understand fundamental biological interactions. Yeah. Right? And that's really what we do. Um, we're explorers of, of just, you know, of nature at, at, the, at the biological level, but we also uh, are interested in, in potentially leveraging those discoveries to, to help people, right, you know, more directly in terms of, of, of human health. Um, and so as we thought about, you know, all the different potential interactions between microbes and uh, the nervous system, um, we chose Parkinson's because it's well known that the, the majority of individuals with Parkinson's um, prior to their diagnosis of a movement disorder will be diagnosed with constipation or will have constipation or, or other pretty debilitating gastrointestinal symptoms, but it's mostly constipation. In some studies, it's people have looked at, at cohorts um, uh, over long periods of time and shown that even up to 80% of people who have constipation, maybe years or decades before the Parkinson's diagnosis, um, you know, or people who were diagnosed would have you know, constipation um, in up to 80% of that cohort. Um, and we found this to be pretty interesting just because there's this gastrointestinal link to, uh, to a neurodegenerative disorder. Um, but also, you know, because the gastrointestinal cell, the GI symptoms preceded the motor symptoms, it suggested, and this goes back to the COVID discussion, right? it suggested that maybe those changes were there or, you know, preceding, maybe predisposing individuals to, to Parkinson's, um, you know, and, and, or maybe even contributing to their, to their motor symptoms. And so uh, that was really the hunch, right, um, that, we, that we had. It was just this, this connection in symptoms. Um, I give the NIH a lot of credit on this one. Uh, they were forward looking in funding a grant. Um, this is NINDS. It was a Eureka grant that was funded um, based on pretty much an idea, right? Um, and uh, it turned out that we were able to show in uh, uh, mouse models of, of Parkinson's that if you remove the bacteria in the mice, the mice no longer exhibit motor symptoms no longer exhibit neuroinflammation, which is a hallmark of Parkinson's disease, uh, specifically microglia in the brains were no longer active in the mice, were no longer activated in the absence of uh, bacteria. And uh, the hallmark pathology of Parkinson's, which is aggregation of a neuronal protein called alpha-synuclein, which leads to these structures called Lewy bodies, which really affect um, neuronal function, ultimately are believed to lead to neuronal death at least part of the process that leads to normal death, those structures, those absolute pathologies were reduced in the absence of microbes. Uh, it's a binary res result. It just shows a correlation between presence or absence of, of an intact microbiota and disease outcomes, but it shows that, again, that their microbes are contributing mm -hmm. in some fashion. And then we did, uh, you know, subsequent to that, a, a series of experiments to try and Id identify, uh, in particular, what are the, the individual organisms which may be contributing to Parkinson's-like disease or preventing Parkinson's-like disease in animals. Um, the work that we've, we've uh, published and, and you know, is most advanced to date are uh, identification of a bacterial pathway which promotes alpha-synuclein aggregation of alpha pathology in mice. And I'll, I'll describe that pathway. Uh, and what we've done to potentially um, intervene in this process. And so uh, this is work of, of Tim Sampson, who was a postdoc in our lab at the time. He's now an assistant professor at Emory University. And what Tim showed is that, and he did all the work on, on the microbiome transplants and the, and the uh, uh, removing of the microbiome that, that I described a minute ago. And so uh, by looking both in animal microbiomes and in human microbiome profiles, from patients, he showed that there was an, or he discovered there was an increase in 
particular organisms, which are highly related to E. coli, um, that uh, display particular structures on their surface called curli, C-U-R-L-I. And what curli are, are these, they're like these adhesins, they're similar to like the, the, the surface proteins I was describing in Staph aureus. I mean, they're, they're different structurally in, in, in terms of, of their identity, but their general function is partly overlapping, is that they allow uropathogenic strains of E. coli and related organisms to adhere to bladder epithelial cells to cause urinary tract infections, right? But these bacteria live relatively, to the best of our knowledge, asymptomatically in the gut. And there are people um, in a number of universities who study this who believe that uh, UTIs are caused essentially by, you know, ba these bacteria that are living in the gut getting into the, the uh, urinary tract. Huh. And so, uh, and they use again curli to cause infection, but um, bacteria do express curli when they're in the gut. What's interesting, and what Tim, you know, these are the pieces that, uh, piece that Tim put together, is that these curli are uh, made up of a protein that uh, fall into a class of proteins called amyloids, right? Amyloids are proteins that are self aggregating proteins. Humans have, I think, 30 or 40 amyloids, uh, bacteria. It's like a, an unknown chemical space, but there's many dozens of bacteria that have been shown to have amyloid proteins, probably many more that we don't, just simply don't even know about because we're still exploring the microbiome. Um, but he found it to be curious that, you know, there's more of these bacteria and they're closer to the tissue, uh, uh, the intestinal tissue in Parkinson's patients compared to healthy controls. And that it was particularly not all E. coli, but the E. coli that have these curli fibers. And so he hypothesized that maybe curli is somehow accelerating or augmenting alpha-synuclein pathology because alpha-synuclein is also an amyloid. And again, the property of amyloids is that they misfold and one protein subunit, let's say just for the curli subunit, right? So one protein subunit of curli binds to another protein uh, the curli protein and causes that one to misfold and aggregate and then leads to this, this cascade that ultimately leads to these large hairballs, these large aggregates of proteins, right? So it's almost like the self-promoting process. So somewhat and, similar to the prion. Very, conceptually very, very similar to the prion, mm -hmm. but here you, what you have is, in, in fact, biochemically similar as well, but here you have is a microbial yeah. you know, molecule that's interacting with a human yeah, mouse molecule, yeah. right? And what's what again? He showed in mice, in cell culture, and in just test tubes, just using biochemical reactions, that the curli protein can induce alpha synuclein to uh, aggregate more rapidly, right? And then uh, show that in mice, that the bacteria that had curli led to alpha synuclein aggregates in the intestines of the mice, and over time, those alpha synuclein aggregates moved to the brains of the mice, and then caused all the hallmark pathologies of Parkinson's. And so again, this doesn't prove that this is happening in people. I believe it is, but it's probably happening in a subset of individuals because we've shown that these, again, these curly fibers are found in, in about 30 to 40%, depending on, on the course that we looked at, of Parkinson's patients. Um, but what this, in a, and obviously we did several more experiments, but what this process showed, again, this notion that a bacterial protein can interact with a neuronal protein and then, and then leads to this downstream cascade that, that results in pathology and disease is that this is potentially a process that we, where we can intervene with small drugs, small molecule drugs, right? Yeah. And um, what Tim did in collaboration with Axial Therapeutics, which is a, a biotech company that I started many years ago, was to ask, can we deliver drugs to the gut, not to the brain, but to the gut that somehow interfere with this process and maybe therapeutic in Parkinson's, right? And the advantages uh, of doing this are that you don't have to get drugs across the blood brain, blood brain barrier, which is very, very challenging and leads to lots of side effects, right? Because most drugs that we take that, that ultimately are targeting the brain, they float around in our circulation, they bind to cells and receptors they shouldn't and they cause all sorts of uh, other effects, right? Um, and so the bar is just much lower when you're delivering drugs to the gut. Um, and he showed that an anti-amyloid drug um, prevents this interaction and essentially inhibits the bacterial 
mediated process of alpha sleuking aggregation mm -hmm. in mice. Nice. Um, and so, uh, and it's a safe and natural uh, drug. In fact, initially we used it was a, a tool compound uh, that is a product of green tea, right? Oh. And so uh, it's not and certainly, you know, not toxic because people uh, consume large amounts of green tea in, in a number of different <laughs> societies. But there's a this particular molecule from green tea, which was known to have anti-amyloid properties. There you go, right? Yeah, the molecule is called EGCG. Um, and it's one of the main polyphenols found, found in green tea. Um, and that was therapeutic in the animals. And so uh, again, we're pretty bullish on this approach because we believe that it may be a way to deliver what are clearly safe yeah. drugs to people. Um, and I don't presume in Parkinson's that we would be able to reverse you know, any damage or any symptoms, but we may be able to slow down or even yeah. halt the yeah. progression of the disease. Yeah. What I'm also, you know, hopefully, uh, I'm also pretty excited about is the ability to improve gastrointestinal function or these, the constipation that many patients um, have reported in, in some cases are, you know, are more debilitating, let's say, at least early in the disease, are more debilitating than the motor symptoms, right? So if we can improve GI function, we may be able to improve quality of life. <laughs> That's very exciting uh, findings. I had I was thinking and looking over your research, uh, and so you mentioned the blood-brain barrier, and and you know it's hard for drugs to get into the brain when you take them orally, for example. There's a lot of work showing that um, the blood-brain barrier is a little leaky in the olfactory. Uh, epithelium. Okay. Olfactory epithelium. And the question I had is, what's the bacterial, is the bacterial composition of the nose and sinuses similar to the gut, or is it very different? It, it's different. It's different. And so um, I'll give you one, one sort of, St statistic or, or general statistic about this is um, my microbiome, my gut microbiome is more similar to your gut microbiome than my gut microbiome is to my nasal or skin microbiome, mm -hmm. right? So different organisms, um, different communities um, living in, in, in each of these, these locations, right? Um, and, you know, maybe an extension to, to your comment is people have shown, this, I think one study now, they've shown that the nasal microbiome is different in a Parkinson's cohort than in healthy controls because loss of smell uh, or factory deficits are also yeah. prodromal, meaning that they precede yeah. motor symptoms in Parkinson's. So there may be this relationship both the gut and you no know, factory system. In fact, I, I'd be remiss to not mention Brake's hypothesis, B-R-A-A-K, yeah. um, who proposed you know, about 20 years ago that Parkinson's may begin in the gut or yeah. may begin in the olfactory system and move its way up into the central nervous system, the brain stem, and ultimately the brain that leads to disease and exp explains this temporal timeline, right? Why these symptoms occur early in the gut and in, 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 the olfaction, uh, in the olfaction, and then later, many years later, affect the brain. Um, I'm not that uh, old. Uh, I, don't, uh, I don't think, uh, yeah, I don't think the, the gut or anything in the gut or the, or the olfactory system causes Parkinson's. I think it may contribute or accelerate um, uh, the, that pathology. I, I think, I do believe that there are genetic and environmental factors that are, uh, other environment factors that are very important in disease as well. For a long time, it was thought that the brain was immune privileged, uh, at least from the standpoint of the adaptive immune system where, you know, you have these circulating white blood cells and the thought was they didn't get into the brain. Now there's some evidence maybe they do. They do. And yeah, and I was wondering, it would, it would be interesting to study the interaction at the nasal epithelium of the immune cells, you know, like in just in that area on the other side of the epithelium. Yeah, the same concept with the gut, which is study, you know, more yeah. studied, right? Um, and what you're referring to is, you know, a lot of work just in the past few years that have shown that we have a lymphatic system in our meninges around our brain where many, you know, really almost even obscure immune subsets live. 
And, you know, they may or may not in some, I mean, in the absence of patho uh, pathology, they may or may not penetrate into the parenchyma of the brain, but they can certainly send their molecules, including cytokines into that local environment. And if you couple, and that's, you know, the meningeal lymphatics research, but if you couple that with research that showed that particular cytokines can shape behaviors and neuronal function, then maybe those two things are um, connected, right? Where immune cells are primed or altered in the gut or the nose or other peripheral tissues, they get into the meningeal lymphatics and then they can uh, send signals, either cellular signals or, or soluble humoral signals into the brain that then can affect behavior. Well, this is a very exciting area from the standpoint of translational research going to clinical trials. As you mentioned, the fecal transplants are perfectly safe. So, you know, many studies will be done with that. And also the possibility of taking the species that you found beneficial and just eating that species of bacteria, right? Uh, and so I'm sure... Yeah. yeah, there's companies I imagine that are focused on, you know, developing marketing pills with good bacteria and oh, LBPs, live uh, 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 biotech, uh, bi live biotherapeutic products. Right, that's what yeah. the FDA refers them to, and there is a lot. And so maybe we'll conclude with this notion that you know I feel like I talked a lot. Maybe that's what was the context I talked a lot about myself and in our work, but um, this is a. a broad and growing area of research, right? And at all levels, not just the gut brain, but the immune response, the, the therapeutic aspects, there are companies, laboratories, very interested in you know, trying to harness what are really believed to be safe therapeutics to help um, people, whether it's just you know, normal digestion, live normal lives, maybe get over their brain fog, but also hopefully someday uh, uh, really addressing patient populations and unmet therapeutic areas. Including, uh, we didn't really mention obesity, but I think some of the earliest studies with microbiome composition and health were showing that people with obesity have a different composition than more slender people. And I think there's some studies showing you can, well, in animals, you can kind of reverse obesity Yep, or you can transfer obesity from humans into, into mice. Uh, this is this circles back to Jeff Gordon, who whose you know two pager got me interested in, in this in this field. You know, a lot of that in, are either his work or people who who were trained in his laboratory have gone on to do you know much of the obesity research. Again, you know, not our area, but a lot of really exciting science uh, going on there. And again, hopefully helping people. I mean, as we know, obesity is now you know an epidemic. In the U.S., it's predicted, you know, I've seen some estimates that half of the U.S. may qualify as being obese sometime in the next uh, 10 to 15 years. Uh, so, so a huge uh, issue there as well. Yeah, I'm going to have a podcast on obesity in the brain because it's, there's a lot of evidence that, you know, long-term obesity is not good for the brain. Even in kids, there's evidence that uh, compared to people, to their normal weight peers, their cognition is not as good on average. So, okay, uh, Sarkis, I enjoyed this talk. We, you know, it's actually such a short time, an hour when you start, when we start talking about these things, but I hope the viewers and listeners learn something. I'll put in the description on the YouTube channel links to some of your key publications, review articles, uh, and a few of your lectures, which there's already a number on YouTube. And uh, yeah, so thanks again. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mark, for, uh, for you know, your time and, and your generosity in, in uh, hearing about our work. I'll send you some of our papers on the toll-like receptors. I don't know if you've seen them or not. So. Yeah, I will. All right. okay. Bye. Thank you.